I'm Gerald Chelamy and I'm a wildlife biologist and a shared management specialist and I work for the wildlife branch for the province of Manitoba. My name is uh, Robert Bruce. I'm a regional wildlife biologist with uh, the wildlife branch central region out of Gimli. My name is Matt Tower. I'm the regional wildlife manager for the western region of the province and uh, yeah I work for the government of Manitoba. What we're doing here is we're, we're flying um, we're flying aerial moose and elk surveys in the uh, Turtle Mountain area of the province in the far southwest here. This, this survey that we're flying here is, is kind of our traditional method that we've flown for years and years. And so essentially um, how that's done is, is in a helicopter with uh, experienced trained biologists that identify moose and elk from, uh, from the air. We do our surveys in, the, in, in winter when we have enough snow. Uh, the animals are very easy to see, there's no leaves on the trees, so uh, it, it's, it's optimal conditions for viewing animals. We use a helicopter to fly a grid system um, back and forth across the, st the study area, the survey area. Um, we have observers either side of the back seat, we have a crew chief in the front. Uh, the observers are focused on looking for animals, and then the crew chief records data and basically guides the ship as we do our survey. So kind of what a normal day looks like right now with, uh, with our traditional survey method is uh, the biologists are, are flying in the helicopter right now and uh, I'm essentially ground support. So we communicate with the helicopter once every 30 minutes to make sure that they're safe and everything's going okay. Uh, they'll let us know what waypoint they're on so they'll have coordinates associated with that. So if anything does go wrong then we know where they were spotted last, where they were located last. So. Uh, my job is essentially to hold the fort here and record where they were last, make sure everything's going okay, and in case of emergency, to uh, have an emergency contact on hand and, and get in touch with them if needed. And we also have an app that we can track the helicopter as well in case of emergency too. So You actually are flying basically at 400 feet and then when you see, you see a, an animal that you want to, to determine its age and sex, more so the sex, um, you actually, the helicopter will often bank and get a little bit lower and do some quick turns around the animal and then you're looking for some characteristic features of uh, a bull, a cow and a calf. In this particular survey we're focusing our attention on moose and elk and uh, you have to have a lot of training and experience to know what you're looking at on the ground. Uh, bulls and cows and calves can look quite similar so you have to often circle the animal a few times to get the correct angle so you can get a good look at, uh, at the animal. And we make a, you know, a joint decision, a joint call. Some folks can see the animal better from their side of the helicopter versus the other side of the helicopter. It's actually quite a you know, difficult job actually flying in the helicopter all day and, and concentrating looking down on the ground. Um, because it is quite fatiguing looking out the window, we, we need to take, you know, breaks basically and give your eyes a chance to have a bit of a rest. So we would go out uh, normally, you know, uh, two hours or a bit more and then come back in and have a, a few minute break to uh, rest your eyes and uh, move around a bit because it's quite, you know, you're quite contained and focused in there. So you get a bit of a, get a bit of a break before you go out again. We have to make sure that we're, we're flying when there's a minimum at least of 30 centimeters of snow. Uh, fresh snow is better because it uh, gives you a new chance to see fresh tracks, whereas if it's old snow, there can be many tracks. Fresh tracks is helpful to look at because it can help guide your eyes towards the animals. Of course, we consider the wind. We consider uh, the amount of hoar frost or snow in the trees. And if there's, if there's too much, we're just not able to fly because we don't have good visual. It's, it's really important for us to know, or it's really important for us to um, develop the most accurate population estimate for these animals in this area because this helps to guide management and, and conservation, sometimes potential recovery efforts for, for these animals, especially, you know, moose with, uh, you know, we're seeing some declines in, in certain areas of the province. So it's really important that we develop um, accurate population estimates that we that can help to guide our our management moving forward too. I am Drew Troush. I am a wildlife biologist and aerial sensor operator for Owyhee Air Research. 
Owyhee Air Research, or OAR as we call it, is a private research company based in Nampa, Idaho. Uh, we do all sorts of wildlife research across many different species in North America. A lot of uh, large mammal work for deer, pronghorn, bighorn sheep, elk, moose. Uh, we work on polar bears in Alaska um, and a lot of bird species as well, a lot of grouse and um, sage grouse, prairie chickens. So we cover a lot of different species around North America. This is our second season working in Manitoba for big game surveys. We, last year we surveyed for moose, elk, and white-tailed deer. This year we are covering game hunt area 13, 18, 26, and the Turtle Mountain Provincial Park. And we're surveying for elk, moose, and here in game hunt area 26, woodland caribou and moose. So the benefit of the survey method is we can cover a tremendous amount of ground in a relatively short amount of time. We fly at night because that's when the ambient temperatures are at the coldest and so we're going to have the greatest contrast between the environment and the large body of a moose that's putting off a lot of heat. So when it's nice and cold out in the winter and at nighttime, we're going to have a large glowing heat signature coming off a moose or a caribou or an elk. So typically we get to the airplane two hours before uh, sundown, so we have some time to prepare the aircraft for survey. Then we get ready to take off about half an hour before sundown, so we have a little bit of light to get off the ground and then we're on our way to the survey area right at sundown. Um, you know, that allows the environment to cool down a little bit and let the uh, thermal signatures really pop on those animals that we're looking for um, and then we're we're on target for um, as long as possible we're surveying for sometimes five six hours at a time these planes are very capable of flying for extended periods which is great we can cover a lot of ground in a single flight um, after that sometimes we'll come back refuel and head up again to cover even more ground if conditions are right the P-68 is a very capable aircraft that allows us to fly close to the ground and slow and in variable conditions like high winds. Um, allows us to be very safe while we're operating and also collect high quality data. We are using the Teledyne FLIR STAR 380 HDC sensor on board the P-68. It is uh, in incredibly high-tech infrared sensor originally developed for military applications. This sensor allows us to detect wildlife from beyond two miles out um, and up close it collects incredibly high-quality images of the wildlife we're looking at. We're able to count antler points on elk and you know determine sex and age of anything we're looking at. Recording the observation is very valuable because that allows us to, after the fact, confirm the counts. Sometimes we come across groups of as many as 200 elk. In the case of the Turtle Mountain Provincial Park, there were very large groups of elk in densely forested areas, and the, the infrared sensor is able to see right through those trees and get a good look at those. But the footage actually allows us to review that and actually recount the animals as many times as we need to get a, a good count that we're confident with. So any moisture in the air will affect us. Uh, so we try to fly, you know, when there's as little moisture in there as possible. Uh, we, the sensors are capable of, you know, um, seeing through some moisture, but uh, we prefer as clear of a night as possible. Frost does not affect the performance of the infrared sensor. We're not looking for the, the visual portion of the light spectrum. So instead, we're just detecting temperature. So anything cool is just gonna be black and anything warm is gonna be white. So there's no color reflection that we need to worry about. It's simply temperature. So anything cold like frost is actually gonna be a benefit to us while we're surveying. So while we're in the air looking for wildlife, we're at surveying from 1,500 to 2,000 feet AGL, or above ground level. This allows us to fly safe 
uh, but also at a low level where we're getting a good view of the ground while also avoiding any terrain or obstructions on the ground. When we do detect an animal, the pilot will turn and start circling that animal. At 1500 feet AGL, the wildlife is not aware of our presence. They very rarely react to us at all. They are usually feeding or sleeping and don't even, even acknowledge that we're there. While circling, it's my job as the aerial uh, sensor operator to start collecting the information we're here to collect, being the count, how many animals are in the group, age and sex of the animals there. The data we collect in the game hunt areas will be used by the province to you know, develop management plans for the species we are observing. So my name is Michael Melville, I'm one of the co-founders at Superwake and our company does aerial uh, wildlife photography and video imagery. So we've been doing this for, the company started about three years ago, this is our second year in actual wildlife operations. Um, we worked last year for the province and we're back again this year to do some more work for them. Hey, I'm Travis, I'm the CEO of Superwake. We're censusing wildlife um, undulates like deer, moose, elk, caribou, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so we're flying our drone, uh, getting a count for the province, uh, delivering that data. Everyone will think when they hear a drone, quadcopter can only fly about 20 minutes or so. Our technology is a bit different. We are more operate like an aircraft, um, so we have a lot longer endurance. Our aircraft can stay airborne for pretty much all day. Um, battery powered, we have solar cells um, on the wings, so the solar will keep us up during the day, and then if we need to fly overnight, we can fly overnight just on batteries alone. Um, and what really where we excel, especially in terms of compared to other drones, is just the endurance. We can do these lawn missions, you know, like other survey methods can, but just remotely, no one on board, um, and we can control it all from our own, our own ground station. So our typical missions will usually show up with about three people. Basically, all that's really needed for is the assembly of the aircraft, um, and we'll have one payload operator, one pilot, um, and then a support person for payload, and then we can kind of just swap between roles throughout the day. It's like we'll set up in the morning uh, around sunrise, we'll launch the drone, and then it'll go into an auto mission where it's flying the transects. Um, we set the wits for that, like usually we do full coverage surveys, so our transects are 750 meters wide, um, so the plane's just going up and down, Mike's on the laptop or our payload operator is on the laptop. Um, if he sees something, then we'll put the plane into a loiter there and we'll loiter until they get an idea of like whether or not the footage they have is good enough to, to age and sex or whatever they're looking at. We'll fly those auto missions, we'll put it into a loiter until that's done and then it's back to the mission and we just keep going. And, and uh, yeah, with, with the solar working, we'll just do that all day, land around the evening, um, just before sunset, and, and yeah, that's a day for us. The infrared really is just to, for tagging. It makes it easier, especially if the animals are in a big herd, to do the counts, because their heat signatures will pop out way easier than on the RGB camera. Um, and then the RGB camera, we have a 20 time optical zoom, so we can zoom, even if we're, you know, half a kilometer away, we can zoom right in and see that, you know, yes, that's a white-tailed deer, that's a moose. Um, and depending on whether the animal is standing up or sitting down, we can uh, do age and sex as well. So yeah, one of the, the big advantages, especially with being electric, is you really can't hear it. Um, even if you're flying only 50 meters above, it's like pretty much whisper quiet. So any of the loitering we've done above animals, they, they don't seem to care. One drone right now, what we can do is about 150 square kilometers in a day. Um, and that would be a full eight hour day. Um, so if we had three drones, triple that, that's about 450 square kilometers in a day. So we could do, you know, 1,000 square kilometers in, a, in two or three days, say, if we had multiple drones. Um, again, we're, we're obviously at the mercy of the weather. Um, flying in, you know, January, February time, the weather is usually pretty predictable. When you get into the shoulder seasons, then it starts to get a bit dodgy. But basically any day um, that any other aircraft is going to be flying at low altitude, like a helicopter, we'll be flying as well. Um, so that's kind of our, our limits there. Visibility will be a big thing why we wouldn't be able to fly. Like, yeah, fog, snow, we're not gonna fly in any of that because the eye, even if we could, uh, didn't have to worry about icing or anything like that, the camera just is gonna have a hard time seeing through that, um, much like a person would have. Um, and winds, like super high winds, we're not gonna be able to fly in. Um, 
just for the safety of the aircraft, but our wind limit is about 40 to 50 kilometers an hour. Um, that's about the max we want to push it, just to, for, for safety's sake. What we notice when we're flying is the animals don't really mind it at all. Like sometimes they'll notice it and you'll see them look at the drone, but then they'll go back to what they're doing, like eating or lying down. So we don't really seem to disturb them or, or be a threat to them, which I think gives us some interesting insight. Like we can kind of park over top of one and just watch what it's doing without, without really interfering. Um, I think that's part of the reason why the province has us here because there's a lot of like domestic cattle uh, they don't want to fly the helicopters close because they'll disturb it with, with all the noise and stuff. So um, that's that's kind of the exciting part for us is we, we see a lot of potential in, in what we can learn through that. So yeah.